My name is Ricardo Abreu. I am Technology Chief Officer at Bright Consulting. And I'm glad to be here today to talk to you about the alternatives for sustainable mobility. Sustainable mobility is part of the biggest challenge humankind is going to face in the years to come because the global warming is as dangerous as the COVID pandemic. And in the same way, we have to find a way to flatten the curve of temperature highs. And for that, we need to use all alternatives we have available. And unfortunately, a false dilemma has been a strong discussion in this moment when people think that we have a bifurcation and we need to choose only one way to proceed, either using electric vehicles with big batteries that I called here batterization or using biofuels in a way that must be paved but can also bring good results. In fact, the truth is all these alternatives must be combined in order to have an affordable and quick way to fight for the temperature control in our planet. The, all combustion must be combined and it must be found a way to make the best use of the energy we have available. For that, the key points are fuel efficiency, low carbon energy source, and efficient device to convert this energy into work. The electrification is the best way to make the energy effectiveness available in all kinds of vehicles. Electrification is the use of electric motors uh, to bring the energy direct to the wheels without the necessity of mechanical powertrains, gearbox, and things like that, which is quite more effective. And besides that, electric motors can be used to recover the energy during braking and deceleration periods. That makes a big difference when we talk about fuel consumption. Low carbon intensity energy source are normally biofuels or other renewable energies like ethanol, biodiesel, or even the e-fuel. It's a new category of fuel, electric fuel, e-fuel, that's made out of clean electricity, solar, wind, biomass, electricity, and CO2 captured from the air. Other sources of uh, low carbon energy are the biomethane, clean electricity, and green hydrogen, mainly produced from this clean electricity, that means solar, wind, biomass, and nuclear energy. The difference among them is some of them, the liquidus one, have already an infrastructure in place to be used. And for the others, uh, infrastructure must be developed and that's going to take some time. When we talk about the device to transform the energy into work, we have two main groups. When you produce the energy inside of the vehicle to bring that to the wheels. We are using, for instance, ICEs, internal combustion engines with biofuels. And when you decide to produce the energy in a electricity form, in a remote way, we use electric motors with batteries. But these two main streams give origin to different combinations like hybrids, hybrid plug-in, hydrogen fuel cell, and biofuel fuel cell. 
which of these combinations among these three items are going to be more used in the future. In fact, all of them will have the right place and the right time to be used. Looking at this diagram, you can see why it's important to combine these alternatives. Because if you see the fuel consumption in terms of energy per kilometer in such a way that we can compare different platforms talking about energy use, and we can compare the greenhouse gases emission in terms of grams of CO2 equivalent, that means all kinds of gases that produce greenhouse effect per kilometer, but calculated on the whole cycle. That means the production of vehicle, batteries, assembly of the vehicle, and use of the vehicle, in this case, without considering the recycling that the, would be the last phase of complete LCA. We have here three big groups, three big platforms. The platform using internal combustion engine, hybrids, and electric. And you can see that in spite of having different fuel consumptions, they are not quite different in terms of emission of greenhouse gas. Who plays a very important role here is the fuel carbon intensity. If we run on an internal combustion engine vehicle, even considering the technology developing, developed from 2017 through 2032, passing by 2022, 2027, the amount of greenhouse gases produced is very high. While the same technology using uh, E100 fuel, that means 100% of ethanol produced from sugarcane can have a very low greenhouse gas emission. We don't have enough ethanol for all vehicles nowadays, but we can use that to blend with the hydrocarbons here. And in Brazil, in fact, we have our flex fuel vehicles running on E27, that's our gasoline, let's say so, and running also on E100. You can choose what kind of fuel you are going to use. But just as an example, if we would be able to mix all ethanol we have with all gasoline we have, the average blend called here Renova Bio average would give us this behavior in terms of greenhouse gases with a mixture of uh, 40 to up to 5. 55% of ethanol in it. You see that that brings a big advantage in terms of greenhouse gas emission. If we use hybrids, that means internal combustion engine with electrification, the benefit is going to be even better than running only on uh, internal combustion engine. And that's a good way to, to go because that's a very, very quick solution to be implemented and used. And the third group here, electric and fuel cell vehicles, also depend of the fuel quality in terms of carbon intensity. If the electricity is produced from natural gas, for instance, even considering the development, future development of electric vehicles, they are not going to be as good as we need in terms of greenhouse gas reduction. Even in Brazil, with our good uh, electricity matrix, with a grid with 45% of renewables, this level is already very good, but that's not quite different from using uh, hybrids running on this blend here. For sure, in the future, using more and more clean electricity source like solar, biomass, and wind mainly, 
that's going to become cleaner and cleaner. And in a point in time here, we are going to have to decide if we keep producing electricity only for electric vehicles, facing the problem with the material source for batteries, or we go to fuel cells. Fuel cells can run on hydrogen, green hydrogen produced from this clean electricity, and also can be produced through fuel cells running on ethanol or other biofuel. In the future, these both solutions are going to be in this area here, that are the area considered to be necessary to control the global warming. Again, it's not a matter of choosing one way of, or the other, because what this diagram doesn't show is the time when these alternatives are going to be available. Then, best thing to do to them is to combine them all together in the best way that every singular situation in different countries, in different cities, should be used. We must remember that both ways are going to get together again. But for the time being, we need to fight to reduce the cost of electric vehicles because the battery is still being very expensive. And we will have to invest a lot in the infrastructure to recharge these vehicles. On the other hand, the countries that have bio fuels available must invest in developing better technologies to use these vehicles, to use the biofuels in the best way they can. One affordable solution here for a short term would be the development of a popular hybrid using, for sure, the electrification and running on biofuel blends. It doesn't need to be the edge technology. We can use a little bit less expensive technology in terms of components, electric engines or electric motors and other stuff, small batteries, and produce an affordable solution for starting right now to reduce the greenhouse emissions. Later on, when this both ways just get together again, we are going to have green hydrogen being produced from clean electricity, but then we need to invest on compressors or uh, press stations to bring this hydrogen to 700 bars and to be used on high pressure vessels in the vehicles. Here, we would have to develop the reformers to transform biofuels in hydrogen, green hydrogen as well, with the advantage that the basic infrastructure is already in place. Once that's going to be the same, we use it today for ethanol dispensers. Again, all these ways must be worked out together. And for sure, the best way to go in the future is to have a combination of all of them that allow us to use the hydrocarbons, the fossil sources we have today, longer than it was expected by combining hydrocarbons with biofuels, for instance, because that's a cheap energy and we need to have cheap sources of energy and combine them with different sources here in different combinations, hybrid gasoline ethanol, for instance, hybrid using blends, electric vehicles, mainly for the city centers, for buses and urban fleets that can optimize the use of the infrastructure. And in the future, the fuel cells will have a very important role, mainly on the heavy duty sector, transporting goods and people. A big part of our greenhouse gases produced on transportation are from this segment here, and a solution must be found to it as well.
that's what I had to present today. I thank you very much for your attention. Hello, everyone. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Gustavo Santos Lopes. I work for Robert Bosch Brazil in Campinas, São Paulo. Today, I'm going to share with you the results of the work entitled as Water Injection Enabling High Efficiency Flex Fuel Engines Focused on Ethanol. Brazil is well known by his flex fuel fleet, composed by more than 80% of flex fuel vehicles, which can be filled by gasoline E22, ethanol E100, or any mixture between E22 and E100. The history of this scenario started in the 70s with Pro Alco program. It brought at the time the possibility to buy a car filled just by ethanol. In Brazil, we can say that ethanol history can be divided in waves. The first one started in the 70s, going through flex fuel launch on 2003. In 2007, the world started to pay attention on renewable fuels, while in Brazil, more than 90% of vehicle production was flex fuel. The second wave started in 2012 with Innovarauto, an automotive regime that brought to Brazilian fleet a 12% increase on vehicle energy efficiency. In 2018, Rota 2030 became our actual automotive regime. It will bring to us a new improvement on energy efficiency, about another 12%. Rota 2030 also seek to benefit the enhancement of ethanol performance, consumption, and efficiency compared to gasoline. Vehicles that deliver a fuel economy ratio between ethanol and gasoline higher than 70% is going to be benefited with additional energy efficiency discounts. Finally, we believe that the third wave would start with this new approach of high efficiency flex fuel engines focused on ethanol. This approach is totally suitable to Brazilian market and decarbonization route. Unfortunately, flex fuel engines went through many bad assumptions regarding its performance. Some people call the technology a duck, which can do many things but anyone in their best class. The price of fuel free choice is dealing with an engine that can run with any fuel mixture between gasoline and ethanol. However, it doesn't take advantage of ethanol properties as the compression ratio is set for better gasoline use, avoiding knocking phenomenon and the problems brought by it. Our objective and main motivation is to dismiss this feeling and deliver a technology that praises the ethanol combustion properties, providing a high efficient flex fuel engine. For many years, this situation extended a dilemma in Brazilian engineers had until now. We've changed how to deal with compression ratio, no longer looking at gasoline needs and keeping ethanol and gasoline fuel consumption ratio as 70% or below. Now, we looked at ethanol needs, increasing compression ratio to take advantage of ethanol physical chemical properties as higher anti-knocking index, higher combustion flame velocity and better cooling chamber effect. The choices have made possible an improvement of ethanol performance and efficiency, increasing fuel consumption ratio to higher than 70%. Our complete solution should avoid a new family of engines and costly hardware changes. Keep this in mind, we've decided to increase compression ratio to 15 to 1 at a PFI natural aspirated engine and to 13 to 1 at a DI turbocharged engine, just by changing the baseline pistons. The compression ratio increase made knocking phenomena to appear when the engine was filled by gasoline. It was controlled by water injection, decreasing combustion chamber temperature. In some situations, variable valve timing strategies were also used to control knocking, decreasing effective compression ratio when needed. An example of decreasing effective compression ratio by managing the valve timing and adjusting the effective compression stroke beginning would be a lack of water in the water tank. In this case, we activate a limp hum function which will control load and engine speed when needed to avoid engine fail, allowing the customer to drive the car somewhere he can fill the water tank. However, it's important to remember that it's a critical situation that would be easily avoided by filling the water tank when the system shows you a lower water level message. It is also important to mention that only mixtures below E60 demands water injection. In other words, 
The engine doesn't need water injection when filled by ethanol. In this case, you can choose the use of a biofuel that brings to you higher energy efficiency, higher performance, no water filling necessity, and that contributes to environment decarbonization in a well-to-wheel basis. This project started in 2015 with the government funding contract signature. The R&D activities started in 2016 in partnership with Federal University of Minas Gerais, where a single-cylinder research engine was used to identify the best compromise for ethanol properties and steel gasoline use. In complement to the single-cylinder research engine tests, computer fluid dynamic analysis were performed to better understand the effect of swill, tumble, cross-tumble, and turbulent kinetic energy regarding different intake layouts. In 2017, we started to work on a multi-cylinder PFI natural aspirated commercial engine, focusing on ethanol calibration for maximum efficiency. At the time, CFD analysis were used to investigate a single point water injection at the intake manifold instead of being assembled on each intake runner. 2018 was time to focus on gasoline plus water injection application, with fuel operation between any fuel mixture range in 2019. Differences between port fuel and water injection and direct water injection were investigated also using CFD analysis. In 2020, the project focused on the GI turbocharged engine, delivering a vehicle also capable to run with any fuel mixture. Talking about the water injection system and its components, we can see in the figures what were added to the vehicle. Beside of the fuel injectors, we've added water injectors assembled in a water rail, keeping the integration between the fuel rail and the fuel preheating system used for ethanol cold start and emission reduction. We've also added a water tank, a water pump, and a level sensor. The ECU software had to be modified to integrate water injection functions to the control system. Finally, to increase the compression ratio, we've changed the pistons in the simplest and costless way to achieve a higher compression ratio. You can see at the picture the baseline and the new piston that reduced the combustion chamber volume, increasing the compression ratio. Talking about our results, here's what we achieved with our PFI natural aspirated and our DR turbocharged vehicles. The results were rated at 55% on FTP75 cycle and 45% on HWFET cycle as required by Brazilian standards. Starting with the PFI natural aspirated case first, we've increased the compression ratio from 11.5 to 1 to 15 to 1. This modification brought an improvement up to 8.1% on ethanol fuel economy and up to 2.8% on gasoline fuel economy, leading to a new 73.8 fuel consumption ratio. This result enabled an additional energy efficiency credit, called echo reduction of 2.7%. This led to an enhancement up to 7.3% on energy efficiency from 1.58 to 1.47 MJ per kilometer. About our DR turbocharged case, we've increased the compression ratio from 10.5 to 1 to 13 to 1. This modification brought an improvement up to 3.2% on ethanol fuel economy and up to 2% on gasoline fuel economy, leading to a new 69.5 fuel consumption ratio. This results enabled an additional echo reduction of 0.11%. This led to an enhancement up to 40.8% on energy efficiency from 1.85 to 1.76 MJ per kilometer. Another important benefit that water injection brought to us was the possibility to avoid fuel enrichment due to component protection strategy. It permits a lambda-1 strategy on the entire engine operation map, an approach that is already beginning to be applied worldwide on real drive emission conditions. To give you an insight about how we achieved these results and why the ethanol fuel economy increased at these levels, I want to show you the baseline and the new engine fuel consumption maps, respectively with 11.5 to 1 and 15 to 1 compression ratios. 
At the right side of this slide, we have the baseline map in the upper side and the right compression ratio map in the bottom side. We can compare the brake specific fuel consumption isolines and prove that we have created two new isoline islands of 375 grams per kilowatt hour, considerably increasing the 400 grams per kilowatt hour isoline island and consequently throwing the other isoline down. When we overlap both fuel consumption maps, we can analyze the brake specific fuel consumption difference. It was proved that we had improvements on the entire engine operation range, up to 12% at load loads, over the entire engine speed range. Even at high loads, we had at least 2% brake specific fuel consumption reduction in some small areas but 4% brake specific fuel consumption reduction or more in most regions. Because of that enhancement, we could achieve 11% of ethanol fuel economy improvement on FTP 75 cycle and almost 6% on the highway cycle. These results show us how much economy the customer would have on urban driving situation, most common situation faced by most people every day. Going to the end of my presentation, these are some of our key takeaways of this development. High efficiency flex fuel engines can be explored if the right approach is applied. An increasement on compression ratio with focus on ethanol properties could improve energy efficiency in megajoules per kilometer up to 7.3% on a PFI natural respirated engine and 4.80% on a DI turbocharged engine, already considering the combination of FTP75 and HWFET cycles and ethanol and gasoline residues weightening. Water injection can manage knocking phenomena avoiding it by controlling combustion chamber and also exhaust gases temperature, allowing lambda 1 control on the entire operation range of the engine and no fuel enrichment for component protection. Considering a well to wheel CO2 emission calculation, the users of a hydrated ethanol or ethanol mixed with gasoline in different proportions is a great solution for a continuous and progressive automotive fleet decarbonization in parallel or associated with electrification in a favorable pace for our market conditions. Thank you. I appreciate your attention. Hello, my name is Eduardo Nogueira Dias. I am an application engineer for Catalyst. Uh, in BASF South America. And today we're gonna speak to you not as BASF, but as SAE Brazil. The topic today will be the biodiesel program, the PA technology feasibility with the B15. That means uh, the PA technology is the Brazilian Euro 6 for heavy duty diesel applications. And the B15 plus is the 15% biodiesel content in the diesel fuel in the pump. We know that uh, the biodiesel and renewable fuels has been uh, growing for the past 15 years. Uh, the production has been growing for the time, not just in Brazil, but in all over the world, as we see here in this chart in the right. And it seems like as the word seeks for carbon neutral uh, energy usage and production, this uh, trend will not change for the future. It will probably continue growing as Many nations over the world is uh, they are really interested into biofuels such as biodiesel, ethanol, and many other kinds of renewable fuels from renewable sources. In Brazil, we have uh, a law that enforces that increase of biodiesel into diesel. Uh, at a rate of 1% per year up to 2023, when we will reach the B15, 15% biodiesel into diesel fuel. Uh, it has been growing 1% per year uh, for quite some time. It varies depending on uh, the diesel 
consumption in the diesel offered from uh, refineries and into the biodiesel uh, availability for the market. But in average, today we are in 13%, as we see here in the chart. And what will happen in 2023? We will have Proconv P8. There is the Brazilian Neuro 6 for heavy duty. Starting together with the B15, 15% biodiesel into the uh, uh, commercial diesel. There is something new for many countries, mainly for, mainly for Brazil, because uh, we always used uh, lower uh, biodiesel content. And it was always in Euro 3 or Euro 5 power trains. But using a B15 uh, in a Euro 6 power train, this will be new. And that's not just experimental. That is not just in a singular dedicated fleet. This will be across the, the country. And we still don't know what really happens when we mix those two things. Brazil is a global pioneer in renewable uh, diesel, renewable diesel uh, content in, in high amounts mixed into the fossil diesel. And we'll be a pioneer using that amount of, of biodiesel in uh, Euro 6 powertrains. This is very important for us to understand what happens to the vehicle, to the systems included into the powertrain, because Brazil and many other countries, mainly uh, countries uh, in development, we are very cost sensitive. The market is very cost sensitive. Uh, the total owner uh, cost, the total uh, ownership cost is very important for us. So the warranty involved in different systems uh, of the powertrain uh, should not be compromised by the use of a high content biodiesel fuel. The biodiesel in Brazil is mainly, or at, not, at least 100%, I would say, uh, what we call FAM, that is the fatty acid methyl ester, that has a different structure from the diesel, uh, from uh, fossil sources. It has a different behavior once it ages into the, the station's fuel tank or in the vehicle's fuel tank. And that aging and uh, uh, the reaction that occurs with the diesel impacts directly the filtration and the injection in the fuel systems. And it also impacts the after treatment system in a long-term usage. Uh, it compromises the DOC light offs. It compromises the DPF regenerations. We need more regenerations and we accumulate more soot and more um, ashes after those regenerations. And we have seen also in former studies from Europe and from uh, United States, that it also compromises the performance of the SCRs. So uh, it is necessary a, a broader comprehension of the B50, T, B15 usage uh, behavior. As I said, this is an unprecedented situation. A real six system running with 15% biodiesel. As we have in Europe, for instance, 7%. In USA, we have different mixtures depending on the application and the region. Uh, in many countries uh, around the world, we have different uh, contents like India, Indonesia, Fiji, South Africa, we have 5%, Australia, South, Af uh, South Korea, Philippines, Taiwan, 2%. Most of those countries are willing and, and looking for 
uh, an increase of that percentage. But everyone is always uh, uh, concerned about what will happen. And Brazil, we are already going to 15% in a Euro 6 uh, powertrain. So what better chance do we have to analyze what happens and to be benchmarked for the world, right? So this uh, project proposal from SAE Brazil is to assure the PA technology robustness using high biodiesel content, 50% or more. Doing the studies with uh, uh, real drive situations in vehicles, doing these studies with engine bench, doing several postmodern analysis in different parts and systems, such as the after treatment system, the injection, filtration systems, uh, the fuel tanks uh, uh, systems, and fuel lines. Uh, so many uh, of the OEMs installed here in Brazil and many suppliers of the chain, they already start working on that. So this is not actually a new topic. It has been around for a couple of years now and many of uh, the main uh, OEMs here in Brazil, they already started analyzing what are the impacts of using a high content biodiesel or biofuel uh, into their systems, these uh, Euro 6 systems. So this study, this project from SAE, it aims to brought together all of their effort and produce uh, some conclusions, produce uh, this study that will be available for sharing and for uh, consultancy from anyone. This will be an open uh, study. So everybody has access to that kind of information in the shapes of SAE. We also have an opportunity to understand what should be improved into the P8 or ER6 powertrains. For ourselves, for our case here in Brazil, for all of, us of uh, South America and for many other countries in the world that are looking also for biodiesel increments into their uh, diesel fuel. We should see some improvements uh, taking place into fuel injection, tanking filtration into the lubrication system of the engines, into the after treatment systems. So, these are all opportunities that we may take into account in this study. Also, listing some of the goals of the study, we look forward uh, to assure the biodiesel content increase in substitution of, bio, uh, of fossil fuels uh, in a very robust way uh, with the minimal uh, changes, changes in the vehicle and in the systems with the more robust fuel we can have uh, been used in the field. We must assure the future CO2 emissions neutrality. Uh, as we know, biofuels has this, uh, biofuels have this um, advantage of being CO2 emissions neutral. Uh, it is very hard to produce energy, to consume energy without emitting CO2. So we, we can try to reach zero emissions as hard as we can, but uh, we will never be completely free. So we also and mainly must look for CO2 neutral and biofuels as Brazilian biodiesel and ethanol, they are carbon neutral. And as I mentioned before, the application must be a drop-in. So the minor changes in the current power trace systems are the best. So we don't have to spend more money developing systems that, that are already developed 
that were developed for the local application or that came from Europe already developed. Some other alter alternatives to the biodiesel uh, fatty methyl ester, uh, the most famous one and the one mostly used in Asia and in Europe is the HVO, hydrotreated veget vegetable oil. It has the same structure as fossil diesel, so it doesn't suffer of that kind of uh, aging and oxidation of the biodiesel uh, ester. It's a dropping solution, so it works just fine as uh, in the current uh, powertrain systems already developed in Europe. Uh, so it is a viable way uh, to substitute and avoid some substitute biodiesel and, and avoid any kind of new investments in development and testing. Uh, of course, it has its downsides also. It is a, a, a more expensive solution to be produced and therefore uh, the product price will also be more expensive compared to the biodiesel ester. Some newer uh, developments, not actually newer, but it is coming around again and it's been talking about is the hydrogen into the internal combustion engines, uh, either diesel or auto cycle. It needs further investigation and development. And a suggestion for uh, future studies is the usage of HVO. As I said, it has no impacts in the current powertrains uh, Euro 6 already developed. It's a dropping solution, but it has a higher cost. The nitrogen, the hydrogen in uh, internal combustion engines, it needs investigation, it needs development. It is uh, somehow being looked in a more um, serious way now. Maybe it becomes something better in the future, but it has uh, also its downsides and its upsides. So we need investigation and development around that item. I must thank you all for watching uh, this uh, brief uh, explanation of what this SAE project uh, might become. As I said, my name is Eduardo Nogueira Dias. Here are my contacts, my LinkedIn uh, contact, if you will. Thank you very much. Uh, we will talk soon in, in the seminar. All right. Thank you. Hello, my name is Christian Weinfried. I work at the business unit for diesel pumps and diesel injectors in Curitiba, Brazil. I'm specialist for diesel fuels and emissions, and I'm here today to talk a little bit with you about the biodiesel future challenges for Procon VP8 for the Be Best 2020-21 Bio Future Summit Second Conference. So just a little bit of introduction first. The context, uh, biodiesel was adopted by the National Biodiesel Program in 2004. Uh, B5 was adopted in 2009. The last big step was in 2016 when a law introduced uh, B10 and B15 for the future. So this law also defined some tests uh, for B10 and B15. Uh, B10 is now in place since 2018 and we are stepping up 1% per year uh, up to B15 which will be reached in 2023. Uh, the tests were defined by a working group of the Ministry of Mines and Energy, AEA and automotive uh, OEMs and uh, suppliers and biodiesel producers and so on under the consideration of local requirements so which are engine and vehicle local Profile soy tallow biodiesel feedstocks, uh, blending ratio where we have B15 in Brazil, B7 in Europe, field quality of this fuel. And one important thing is that this test resulted into the modification of our B100 spec, uh, where we introduced a requirement for 12 hour oxidation stability and mandatory additivation. 
So this uh, just a overview of the test table. You can see it's quite a huge table. We had uh, here some numbers which you can see of the quantity of companies involved and the quantity of fuel which was consumed. The quantity of tests we has we had 60 tests of performance, high mileage, and long stand steel periods, but these tests were all done with Euro 5 uh, technologies, so P7, and there are quite some differences from P7 to P8, which will come in future at the time when P15 will be introduced in Brazil. So just to uh, name some of the differences we have on the, from the emission point of view, a quite huge reduction in the uh, emission limit of NOx and particle matter. And also other requirements we didn't have, we don't have now, we will have in the future, like emission durability of 700,000 kilometers, the in-service conformity and real drive emissions, which were not demanded and will be demanded in the future. This brings quite some challenge to uh, have reliable systems which uh, maintain these emission limits for all, all this emission durability lifetime. Uh, we also have local requirements, Brazilian requirements, quite different from Europe, like uh, a worse uh, quality fuel, uh, quality fuel uh, in, the, in the field. We have some continental distances here in Brazil, so uh, over 4,000 kilometers uh, from south to north, from east to west. Uh, our high thermal load uh, is quite higher than in Europe. We also have poor maintenance and no inspection program here in Brazil. Our logistics is based on trucks with uh, average age about 16 years or even more. Uh, our load factors are quite high, so we have uh, same engines as in Europe, but the gross weight, the allowed gross weight is quite higher than in Europe. And we also have high loads caused by the rugged uh, geography and the road conditions uh, where the vehicles have to slow down and then accelerate again and so on. And of course, as I already said, we have high and still increasing biodiesel plants. Just to name it, uh, Europe has B7 and we are coming up to B15. If we look at the injection system, uh, it has evolved quite a lot in the last years, so now we are talking about systems that work on pressures with 1800 bar or even more, 2200 bar or even more. Uh, the injection tolerance has to be reduced to fulfill these emission limits. Uh, also the leakage has to be reduced so the system could achieve these high pressures. Armature lift was reduced to have higher precision to allow more injections per cycle. The lifetime has also increased and uh, this all is causing a higher uh, backflow temperature, so a higher stress on the fuel. So if we want to achieve the tighter emission limits, we have to work with these modern systems. If we look at the exhaust gas treatment, EGT system, uh, until now, Euro 5 or P7, we work basically on commercial vehicles with the selective catalytic reduction, the SCR system with urea injection at a efficiency of about 80%. And when we look at the future systems, we are adding quite some uh, new features to the exhaust gas treatment and to the engine itself. Uh, we are adding uh, like a uh, oxidation catalyst, a coated uh, diesel particle filter, and even the SCR is also evolving uh, and the efficiency is increasing to 92%. So uh, we need uh, this kind of system to fulfill these future requirements of emissions. Uh, so we have some points of attention for biodiesel, so the higher blends and new technologies uh, to comply with the new regu uh, regulations increase the probability of already known effects. So, for example, the engine oil dilution, the Euro 6 will need late post-injection to regenerate diesel particle filters. Some of the late injected fuel will dilute the engine oil thus reducing the change interval. This is one of the reasons why Europe got back to B7 uh, when Euro 6 began there, because they didn't want to increase the, uh, the frequency of oil change. Material compatibility, soap formation and caulking are closely, closely related. 
So zinc, tin and lead are diluted by biodiesel and will later deposit in form of heavy caulking on the nozzle tip and inside the spray hole or form soaps and internal diesel injector deposits, the famous IDITs, which we see on this picture. These materials have to be eliminated from the fuel system as far as technically possible. I mean zinc, tin, lead, uh, for example. Many other materials like plastics, rubbers and filtering media have to be checked for cont compatibility with the higher blends. We also have another point, which is the drop of the after treatment system efficiency. Uh, some production process related components of biodiesel like sodium, potassium, magnesium and calcium have cumulative effect on the after treatment system and may even clog it after a high mileage. Uh, phosphor, a natural component of vegetable oils, is able to, uh, is able to poison and deactivate catalytic surfaces. The higher biodiesel blend may also cause an accelerated drop of after treatment system efficiency. Uh, the bio biological contamination will continue to be a problem, which we see the effects here on these pictures, causing deposits, acid corro corrosion and premature future clogging as long as best fuel storage practices are not observed. Water has to be frequently perked from the tanks and have to be cleaned and to avoid the formation and growth of bacteria and fungi. Oxidation stability, which has quite similar effects to the biological contamination uh, because they are related, is strongly dependent on the biodiesel feedstock and storage conditions, like contact to oxygen, high temperatures and con contact with copper will highly accelerate oxidation process. In Brazil, about 75% of the biodiesel is made of soy, known for its low oxidation stability causing acid corrosion and aging deposits, sticking and clogging fuel systems components, increasing engine failures and related maintenance costs. Although the recent uh, increase of biodiesel of B100 oxidation stability and mandatory additivation with antioxidants should result into lower fuel claims, we continue to see a high level of fuel claims. On one hand, the biodiesel blend continues to rise, but on the other hand, the whole fuel supply chain has to adopt best practices to keep an acceptable fuel quality in the field. So, we imagined some next steps. Uh, some of them are already happening. Next steps to assure a smooth transition from P7 to P8 and assure the necessary uh, durability of emissions and also durability of the vehicles themselves. So one of these next steps is the fuel distribution quality uh, working group to define improvement measures. Uh, this is ongoing. This is a group formed by fuel distributors, biodiesel producers, government agencies and academic associations. The other next step, uh, fuel storage best practices uh, should be widely disclosed. So AEA, which is the Brazilian uh, Eng uh, Automotive Engineering Association, together with ANP, which is the National Petroleum Agency, will set up a joint version. So this is the example of AEA. Uh, the biodiesel, diesel and biodiesel technique uh, t technical committee of uh, AEA, uh, where I am the, the, the leader of this technical committee, uh, created a booklet uh, almost two, three years ago with best practices for commercial diesel fuel storage, uh, both in a complete and concise version in Portuguese, Spanish and English. Uh, you can download it via this link. It's very interesting. It brings many tips about best practices in the fuel storage. Another next step is the revision of both the commercial diesel and P100 specifications, uh, which will happen in the second quarter of this year. This is very important for the preparation of Procovi P8, which will uh, come into force in 2022, so uh, less than one year from today. Uh, we, I have set up a, a small table here to show you uh, a proposition. Of course, this is uh, just a first approach for the Brazilian B100 limits uh, of some fuel injection equipment and exhaust gas treatment relevant properties. So again, this is non-exhaustive and it's just a first approach. So imagine that the European B100 has these limits shown here in, 
on this table and we time these limits by 7% which is the maximum allowed biodiesel content in Europe is 7 so this we will we would top up with this amount of these components inside the commercial diesel fuel in Europe if we take on the other hand the Brazilian P100 limits and times them by 15%, uh, the Brazilian P100 limits are quite similar to the European limits, except for phosphorus, where Europe already had a big reduction. But if we time them by 15%, uh, we get up uh, more than two times the amount of these components that are present in the European diesel fuel, uh, which is the reference market for the automotive industry of commercial vehicles. So to have a safe launch in P8, uh, for, uh, for the P8 in Brazil, uh, we did some math here and uh, we end up with a proposal of the maximal limits of these components which should be present in the P100 uh, after the revision. So uh, for example, uh, sodium and potassium, instead of 5 ppm, we should have uh, about 2 ppm as a limit. The same for calcium magnesium. For phosphorus, we should even reduce more. We should have less than 2 ppm instead of 10 ppm limit. So this is to ensure a smooth transition to, to P8. Last but not least, also we have to work on the definition and execution of engine and vehicle tests to ensure the fulfillment of PROCOM VP8 requirements and reliability. Not only reliability of the missions, but also re reliability of the, of the engine, of the after treatment system, of the vehicle as a whole. So that's it what I had for today. I hope you enjoyed, was very fast and stay safe and healthy. Thank you very much. Greetings from Brazil. My name is Mike Lu and uh, I am the CEO of Kirkus Diesel Brazil, a company dedicated to biofuel projects since 2007. Today I would like to talk about the efforts to implement a highly integrated value chain concept as a going green recovery pathway. The present COVID-19 pandemic has collapsed the global economy and is bringing humanity to rethink the road to net zero 2050. So the big question mark today is how do we get to net zero 2050? The Great Reset Initiative and 1 trillion trees of the World Economic Forum, the European Green Deal, the Race to Zero, are initiatives converging towards a going green recovery pathway. Crises do bring along opportunities and humanity will need to reinvent itself based on cross-border cooperation in a global effort for post-pandemic green recovery. In this journey to a green recovery, biofuels from sustainable biomass and residues will play a major role together with EVs and hydrogen-propelled vehicles. Indeed, to fully decarbonize the transportation sector, we must address all of the alternatives in sight adjusted to regional resources and demands based on infrastructure, labor, territory, political and climatic conditions. On Aviation Day in June 2012, at Rio Plus 20, we launched the Brazilian Biojet Fuel and Renewables Platform with Go Airlines and other key stakeholders of the aviation industry to foster implementation in Brazil of highly integrated, from research to fly, logistically optimized, multi-feedstock and multi-process regional value chains. Under this concept, we launched in 2014 the Minas Gerais Biojet Fuel and Renewables platform with the state of Minas Gerais which has led us to a proof of concept in 
Zona da Mata, bringing together 46 municipalities for 130,000 hectares effort to reforest the Mata Atlantica biome. This highly integrated platform concept is based on three venues. The first venue is a sustainable biomass venue. At present, feedstock represents around 85% of the biofuel production cost. So sustainable production of biomass by perennial oil bearing trees can be a key to the transition to green energy and natural carbon sink. For this reason, the platform has selected Macauba, a native oil bearing species, for the re reforestation efforts, intercropping it with cash crops and cattle for a change of paradigm towards regenerative agriculture or climate smart agriculture. Very prolific. Macauba produces an average of 4,000 liters of poop oil per hectare in a 5x5 five five spacing as a potential key feedstock for biofuels, in addition to several high-value co-products for different market segments. Zona da Mata is a major dairy farming region, and the proposed intercropping of Macauba with cattle and, and, and cash crops will improve the income of family farmers, reduce the cost of animal feed through Macauba meal, while providing sustainable, traceable feedstock for biofuel and renewables. With a crescent interest on this feedstock and based on a 10-year domestication program supported by Petrobras, commercial Plantations are on the rise in different regions of Brazil. Minas Gerais alone has established a target of 1 million hectares with Macauba contributing to the reforestation target of the Brazilian NDC. The second venue, the technology venue, calls for different process technologies for a data-driven climate smart agriculture and IoT-driven 4.0 industry, intensive use of information technology, artificial intelligence, drone technology, smartphones, will be fundamental for the efficiency of a next-generation micro-entrepreneur in the rural environment and regional distributed processing biorefining platforms. The third venue is a residue venue integrating circular economy processes to convert residues into high-value co-products to reduce production cost of inputs for biofuels and renewables. This highly integrated value chain concept from research to fly is being now implemented in the Zona da Mata region of Minas Gerais with the signing of an MOU by major stakeholders at the launching event on June 5, 2018, setting the stage for the implementation of a proof of concept of this re regional value chain. The Federal University of uh, Juiz de Fora is a leading R&D institution to support the research and development program on synthetic hydrocarbons and renewables for the Zona da Mata platform. A center for renewable energy is being structured in a 40,000 square meter facility at the North Campus in Juiz de Fora. The HEFA route for sustainable aviation fuel and HVO uh, is based on the Green Fuse SABR technology being sponsored by the Prosperity Fund of the United Kingdom. Phase 1 will take place in Q3 2021 with the first run of a GSX biodiesel production module using UCO and Macauba oil as feedstock for SABR process. 
The phase three contemplates a 10,000 ton year pilot biorefining platform for HVO, biojet fuel, and renewables for low carbon oil chemistry um, by 2025. Global attention is now being devoted to ESG. The context of ESG, environment, social governance, can effectively be a cross-border alternative for a post-pandemic green recovery. Science-based studies confirm that Makauba can sequestrate 20 tons of CO2 equivalent per year based on a 5x5 five five spacing in a hectare intercropped with cattle while producing six times more oils and soy in the same space. We are proposing a corporate ecosystem bringing together commercial partners, service providers, transportation companies and co-workers into a joint effort for scope 3 mitigation through crowdfunding of a natural carbon sink. As an example of this corporate ecosystem, we have a leading French cosmetic company neutralizing corporate events and car rental carbon footprint through a natural carbon sink generated by the recuperation of 10 hectares of Mata Atlantica biome with native species in Macauba at the Jean Pinid watershed. As an example of the Flying Green program, we neutralize a flight from Brasilia to Montreal of Secretary of Civil Aviation for a Corsia meeting at ICAO. The carbon footprint of this multi-segment flight was calculated through the ICAO calculator and we planted a Macauba at the same watershed to offset its GHG emissions. Both since carbon pricing will play a key role in boosting reforestation, what are the perspectives of carbon pricing? Based on a recent Bloomberg editorial on carbon, Europe has had a carbon market for more than 15 years. Uh, in, the, in its first decade, uh, prices fluctuated for the first half of the last decade, the price of one EU emission allowance, which represents one ton of carbon emission, bounced around in a range between 4 to 10 euros. That's a low price in the sense that it cost emitters relatively little and therefore did little to change their behavior. Since mid-2016, however, allowances have been on a tier, increasing by a factor of 10 from just above 4 euros to 42 euros last month. After years of oversupply, the market is entering a period of expected future scarcity. Financial investors are piling in and prices are on the rise. Today, as the emissions trading system looks ahead to its third decade, prices are on the move again. With Europe planning to decarbonize its economies, prices will reach an unprecedented level by 2030, which can in turn support the reforestation efforts. Uh, it's a longer-term carbon market that's most interesting, and uh, not just for the carbon market. The deeper decarbonation will be essential to meet Europe's Green Deal goals. As Europe's carbon price rises, it forces companies to be as emissions efficient as possible. If the price is sufficiently high, it just might force the entire economy to decarbonize deeply. That will run through two channels, either substitution of higher carbon materials for lower carbon, and where possible, 
innovations in prod production as well. Would either of those ever happen at a carbon price of 10 euros? No, but they just might at 100 euros. It also means that high emitting industri industrial sectors will be forced to act on emissions and look into renewables. So join the reforestation efforts in the Zona da Mata with Macauba to mitigate your scope 3 emissions and support production of biofuels and renewables through corporate crowdfunding. We have land, climate, labor and a very large diesel fleet to be maintained active for the coming decades towards net zero 2050. Thank you.